Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. Today I'm gonna to dive into one of the latest little money-making, investing, technology trends, which is what is DeFi or decentralized finance. So I'm gonna kind of try and decode it for you. It is something that I've got some clients who are really into and they've been kind of bringing me up to speed on it and it's fairly exciting depending on what it is that you're interested. So. We're gonna cover that today. Hopefully you're gonna learn a lot. If you have some topic that you would like me to cover in the future, please make a comment below. If you have some questions about this, make a comment below. In the meantime, if you guys have not subscribed already, hopefully thank you for our loyal subscribers. And for those of you who have not subscribed, please click the subscribe button, click the notification bell. I hear it's gonna help impart all kinds of exciting news and wisdom to you about the world of finance and taxes and international and offshore and all this kind of stuff. So. With that in mind, let's dive in. All right, so to understand, well, let's kind of backtrack slightly and just talk about you know centralized finance on the context of DeFi. So DeFi, we're gonna get into is some technology. It kind of comes out of the cryptocurrency space and it's really born, I would say, out of the desire to address, first of all, problems with quote unquote centralized finance and uh, what they sometimes called CeFi and uh, then also to address problems that developed in the cryptocurrency space. And I'm gonna give you kind of my take on the macro history of that space, what's going on, et cetera. Now, understand just how much this was like a huge wave this year, all right? So we could take a company called Aave, which was a lending platform. They went by the uh, token uh, symbol Lend. If you bought Lend, the token, on September 1st, 2019, and sold September 1st, 2020, guess what your rate of return would be? Was it, did you 10X in a year? Nope. 20X? Nope. 50? No. Nope. 100? No. Nope. 200X, 20,000% return in that time. If you'd put in 100 grand, you would've got $20 million. Okay, so that kind of tells you the magnitude of what's going on. And I can run down lots. There's like Chainlink and Band, and you know, a, bunch, a lot of different tokens did 100X, many more did 10x and things like this. And so if a person was either smart enough or lucky enough or whatever to have bought into a few of them, even with a small amount of money a year ago and held through this, uh, this wave, it could have been you know, great, uh, great investment returns for you. But that being said, I'm gonna dive into why I think that of the quote unquote crypto bubbles or crypto waves or whatever, this is maybe the least fake and might have the most chance of surviving, but also why it would matter to you uh, in business or in life, et cetera, because it is really a, quite an interesting thing. So let's go back, look at what is centralized finance. Centralized finance is basically the idea that you have some sort of centralized authorities, okay? Usually organizations. Uh, we have you know, usually this top-down hierarchical, like you have a central bank, then the central bank has these other banks, you know, and those have branches. And so you're always dealing with these centralized sources that are kind of funneling up, right? You have governments, you have uh, centralized credit bureaus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What does this mean? Well, this means that it's fragile to uh, volatility, right? So although it tends to exhibit less short-term volatility, over the long term, you know, you can have a bank failure and it's dramatic in terms of the swing. So if you were to read Nassim Taleb's books on, you know, uh, Fooled by Randomness, The Black Swan, anti-fragile and skin in the game. Uh, centralized finance is not what he would describe as anti-fragile, quite the opposite. He would say it was quite fragile, okay? So that's one of the things that, uh, that you might exhibit as a quality. The other is that it is a power structure, meaning that increasingly the financial system has been weaponized, okay? I think this is fundamentally actually a really, really bad thing. I think that the trend in the world of global finance, in particular as it relates to regulation, et cetera, is horrible for the world, okay? It is coming out of a place that, I mean, some people probably would you know, have some sort of conspiracy theories, et cetera, but even if you don't go down that road, you can say it might be well-intentioned, for example, you know, preventing terrorist financing, preventing money laundering, proceeds of crime, all these sorts of things, uh, but the collateral damage is very, very great, and I'm quite concerned that in the world today, the world that we live in, Basically, we have a phobia of risk. And unfortunately, what happens is when you overly shut down risk, you end up shutting down risk taking, which is where your upside comes from. And 
So you just really hurt things in many, many ways. And I think you see this with bailouts that are going on right now. Uh, you see, you know, basically, hey, listen, we don't want these companies to fail. We don't want the market to go down. We don't want all this kind of thing, right? And what do you do? Well, as a result, you skew the uh, incentives, right? The incentive structure goes to hell. Then you end up in a situation where uh, you also kind of screw up the, like you, you stagnate the system essentially. And, uh, and, and you, like, you do a really bad thing because where money goes is not where it should go in order to optimize the system. And uh, you end up typically hurting the little guy. So what we see in centralized finance today is that you know, if you're a big company like Apple, do you have a problem with the banking system? Probably not, because why would you have a problem with the banking system? You know? But if you're a small business entrepreneur who's getting started, do you have a problem with the banking system? Yeah, you may not be able to get a bank account open in a lot of places. Your bank account may get closed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm a big advocate that banking should be a fundamental human right, that the ability to deposit money, withdraw money, transfer, send and receive money should be unimpeded entirely. I don't think there should be any restrictions for money laundering, all that kind of stuff. And the reason for this is that I think that should be handled by the criminal justice system and courts. So in other words, if there is something that somebody is doing transactions that are illicit, by all means, uh, that's a problem. Great, report them to the legal system and under proper court supervision, go through a proper criminal investigation into that and deal with it. That should not be the purview of the banks to randomly decide. And if you just think about what's happened here, why they're doing that, I was just having a conversation with somebody, was it yesterday? Anyway, like in the last couple of days, and they were talking about how uh, you know, there was just, they were having troubles opening a personal bank account uh, when they come to a new country uh, within the EU. And technically under EU regulations, it is a right that they are allowed to have a transactional account, not a savings account, but a transactional account, but the bank wasn't opening it for them. And they're like, hey, you know, this is illegal. The bank, the EU regulations say that I should be able to open it. Uh, and you think about it, like, why should you be able to do this? Because if you cannot have a bank account in the modern day, especially when we're sending, like, first of all, they're like banning cash, right? They're decreasing the amount of cash that's accepted. So your ability to earn a living is going way down. Then a lot of the income is being earned across borders and around the world. Again, your ability to earn a living is going down, right? And you're in a situation where, uh, yeah, you can put, you're effectively just uh, attacking somebody's right to exist, essentially. So it's very, very bad. It shouldn't be allowed at all. And anyway, but the problem is the banks, you know, are you going to successfully, like, what is the process? If some bank denies you, what is the legal ramification and how do you bring it to them so that they have a massive financial incentive to give you the account and maintain the account for you? Because what happens, unfortunately, is that the bank says, hey, I have a negative consequence because the government is going to come after me if I'm seen as facilitating money laundering for any clients, and we've seen massive fines. I think, like in uh, HSBC, I think it was uh, BNP Paribas, uh, both ended up paying fines of like something like nine billion dollars. Uh, obviously, we had the stuff in Switzerland, uh, whatever it was, nine hundred million for UBS, two point was it two point four, two point seven, something like that billion in uh, uh, Credit Suisse, as well as you know these other ones. So on and on and on. The financial incentive for the banks is like, hey, why would we take on risk? We don't make any money off these transactions anyway, right? So there's a very skewed regulatory environment where the incentives favor the banks not taking risks on customers and uh, forcing the banks into policing in ways that they shouldn't be. And of course, you know, you can flip around to the other side, which is that the, uh, the policing system is not equipped to handle the volume of financial transactions and the investigation that would need to take place there. And so you run into all these problems associated with it. So anyway, the whole point is it's really messed up. <laughs> and enter, uh, I mean, first of all, the idea of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin was arguably, in a sense, the first decentralized finance, but it wasn't really considered part of the DeFi wave. So now let's talk about, so what is decentralized finance as a definition? Well, it's the idea that finance is decentralized, meaning that there is no central point of control, no central point of failure, okay? So the way that that's achieved is because it's, you know, kind of a peer-to-peer -peer idea, right? The whole space of how crypto works, and uh, I don't know if I've done a video, if I haven't, I'll do a video on what is blockchain and what is cryptocurrency and what is Bitcoin and how do these things work. But the bottom line is that basically you can have a network of literally thousands of actors or millions of actors, potentially anyone who gets involved, who can help run this system and as a result, there's no centralized point of failure, no centralized point of control, et cetera. And that happens to have a whole bunch of other things. Now, what goes along with it, what's kind of the thing that makes it somewhat unique there 
is that it is run by code, okay? So you're not depending on, the, the, the promise I would argue of blockchain and of cryptocurrency was the idea of decentralizing trust, okay? Or digitizing trust. So when you had what's called decentralized ledger technology, the whole idea here is that, hey, I don't have to trust some counterparty, right? You and I can do business. Let's say we're talking about transferring a title for a piece of property, right? So normally what happens is you have the lawyers involved, right? And you have basically funds go into escrow, uh, the documents come, you have a conveyancing process, the funds get released at the same time the title gets transferred and that way the both parties are uh, treated well. And this is because you can't have me sending you a bunch of money before you've transferred title and you can't transfer title until you've sent me money, right? So here the idea would be that you could remove that, uh, that central party, the escrow party, et cetera, and you could replace it with code. And you could do this with smart contracts, et cetera. So let's kind of dive into this from the standpoint of what I would call history. And then I'm gonna talk about what's really exciting in the last couple of years, uh, in particular the last year and going forward. So the next thing, the, the thing to kind of think about here from my perspective is that cryptocurrency has had what I would consider to be three big waves, okay? Three big uh, phases or something. The first was Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin really came along um, a little over 10 years ago now and it demonstrated that this concept was possible, right? This possible concept of cryptocurrencies, this concept of you know, the blockchain, uh, this uh, immutable ledger, which you know, essentially couldn't be hacked. And so this tremendous resilience, and you know, as the hashing power has increased around the world, this is extremely, extremely robust, okay? Uh, it's probably not anti-fragile, but it's robust, okay? Uh, enter a few years later, we saw uh, I would argue it probably started with the release of Ethereum, uh, but we really saw it take off in 2017, which was the ICO craze, okay, yeah, initial coin offering. And so if we go from Bitcoin to some of these others, what happened there? Well, fundamentally what happened was that Bitcoin was you know, pretty good, but it had some issues. It was high volatility, okay? Its transaction speeds are slow. And it doesn't have a broad range of use cases, which people realized could come about from uh, DLT, okay? decentralized ledger technology. So really I would say it started with uh, the launch of Ethereum. Ethereum is a network which allows, it's basically uh, got a programming language of its own and this network, so think about it this way. Normally what you'd have is what you would have a use case and a use case would have a particular technology which was, uh, We'll call it the blockchain, but actually it's the decentralized ledger. Okay, um, so and now the whole so you had these chains which were designed to maintain the security and uh, value of the system. Okay, perfect. Well, then what happened was for every other new use case, you had to create a different chain, right? And so uh, Vitalik, who was this young guy who started Ethereum he kind of had the insight that he said, hang on, like rather than keep building one chain after another after another, which is difficult because you have network effects and trying to get adoption and things like this, why don't we come up with uh, a centralized operating system for uh, cryptocurrencies, okay? And we're gonna build basically a programming language and people will be able to create their own smart contracts, their own tokens, their coins within the Ethereum uh, blockchain and launch these different projects and there will be a certain amount of interoperability and things like this, right? So he did that. Very brilliant guy. Very cool to listen to him talk. And uh, and you know they've done they've done quite a good job. And really, I would say that uh, in the last year or so, in particular, the dominance of Ethereum is really winning out. There's a lot of competitors to Ethereum. There's things like EOS, IATA, Tron, etc., etc., etc. Polkadot is coming out, etc. There's lots of, uh, lots of others, Hashgraph, uh, lots more, okay? So, all right, great. You've got that, uh, that tapestry. Now, what problems did this solve? Well, first of all, this introduced stable coins, okay? Stable coin basically was typically, at first anyway, pegged to the US dollar. In theory, you can peg it to, you could have a stable coin pegged to all kinds of stuff, right? So you had Tether was the big one that is still today is the biggest. You have USDC, you have Paxos, you have you know, a variety of these different stable coins. And this uh, did a couple things. One is it provided stability instead of the volatility that uh, Bitcoin had, right? That's a good use case. It also decreased the fees of trading in and out because now rather than trading from Bitcoin into fiat and fiat into Bitcoin back and forth,
people could very easily go back and forth within a cryptocurrency or within the cryptocurrency space, okay? So that was useful. This is also where we got exchanges introduced, okay? So you saw the rise of Binance, you saw the rise of uh, Coinbase and Kraken and Gemini and so on. I mean, there's lots of uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, right? So, in fact, they were probably the big winners of that period or certainly one of them, right? What else did you get? I mean, th those are probably, uh, well, I guess the third thing that you got was you got a lot of foundational technology in here. So we got the idea of uh, Bitcoin is built on something called proof of work. We got introduced to the concept of proof of stake. We got, you know, the idea of networks that can run much faster, etc. Okay. The problem in that, well, there was, I, I would argue, two main problems that came about in this. Okay. First of all was that stable coins and exchanges both suffered from organizational risk, meaning that they didn't really truly fulfill the goal of being decentralized. All right. They, uh, they were centralized organizations and we saw lots of exit scams, right? Uh, we saw, so you can start with kind of like Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox was a very famous hack. And so what was happening was you had this, what was called custodial relationship, right? Where you took your crypto, there was this, uh, or it still is, this expression, which is my coins, my keys, or my keys, my coins, sorry. And what this basically means is when you have cryptocurrency, you have your key, and that's what determines that you own it. And in order to exchange it, you would put the money onto an exchange and you would give up that control. It was in a custodial relationship, right? Similarly, if we looked at uh, stable coins, you have this organizational risk where you're first of all dependent on the fact that they actually are doing what they say they're doing. So the idea originally was that, hey, listen, uh, Tether, USDT, would maintain one US dollar for every Tether that was minted and therefore there was complete reserve backing and uh, it had this you know, huge, huge effect. There's a reasonable argument to suggest that Tether could be a fraud uh, over time, it you know, proved to be a huge Ponzi scheme, who knows, obviously they've been investigated and things like this, but uh, trusting them, mm, uh, tough, tough, right? Likewise, you could move to something like uh, USDC, and it's like, okay, they're audited, that's kind of how they decided to try and deal with this problem, but on the flip side, you had uh, KYC risk, right, AML risk. So in other words, somebody could control your, uh, your ability to get your money out, right? So that was no good. So the whole, the whole promise of this was, hey, nobody can shut me down. Uh, we don't have to worry about going through some centralized authority. Anyone can, you know, there's a great deal of flexibility. And we didn't really achieve that there. The good thing, though, was that what this did was it laid the groundwork of a lot of technology on which things could be built. Now, at that point in time, pretty much the only value proposition, I would say, of various tokens was trading them. Okay, so that was a really bad thing. Right? Because you're trading this thing, which if all you can do is trade it, then it's kind of fundamentally valueless, right? And that's, you know, I mean, most of the ICOs were scams or, you know, just sham projects, et cetera, right? They would have these huge rise up and these huge crashes and many of them going to zero and never coming back, et cetera, okay? So, all right, well, that's one, one thing. So this brings us to what I would call the third wave of crypto, which is DeFi. And we'll see what the fourth wave and so on is. But what happened here? Well, now they took the technology that was the groundwork that was laid in, uh, in wave two, and they translated it into being able to achieve a lot more of the goals. So to start off with, for example, was they got basically decentralized algorithmic stable coins, okay, where they were not external reserve based. So you have things like uh, Make or Die, uh, you have uh, Stable Credit is coming out, you have, you know, there's a variety of them. Uh, Synthetic has a, a coin, et cetera. So there's lots of different now uh, stable coins that don't have any organizational risk. You don't have to say, hey, listen, is there some organization that can take the money and run off with it? It's handled all algorithmically within the system. Now, it remains to be seen how well the algorithm can handle extreme volatility. So if the price of Ethereum was to crash from, I don't know, it's maybe about $350 today, if it was to crash down to $100 or $50 and 60% of the reserve is in Ethereum, what would that do to the price of DAI? We'll see, right? That's a whole other, whole other thing. So that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened was that uh, you got decentralized exchanges, right? This is fantastic because there were so many of these exit scams and people doing ripoffs and people losing other people's money, et cetera, like literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, okay? 
So the way they handled this was they came along and they created algorithms where you could basically uh, trade. So we have things like Uniswap, we have Balancer, et cetera. These are common ones that allow you to, at least in the case of Uniswap, do what are called ERC-20 tokens. So these are on the Ethereum blockchain. So in other words, these exchanges, because of the nature of their uh, technology, do not allow you to trade anything. But on the other hand, before what would happen was these centralized exchanges like Binance, you would want to list your coin on it and you'd have to go through an approval process. You'd basically have to pay them a lot. Uh, they would hype your token, things like this. That's part of their business model. And not just anyone could list, right? Which again, kind of defeats the whole purpose of this decentralized thing. Whereas with Uniswap, basically anyone can list very easily. Anyone can trade very easily and it's non-custodial. So you don't have to worry that you're giving up control of your thing and you could lose it. Somebody could take it, right? So that's very, very good. So these are some, some little use cases, but along with that, what came out was a bunch of other use cases, which maybe I'll talk about further in the future, that are making suddenly crypto coins much more valuable. So let's start with the first one, which was lending against crypto. So this was what Aave or Lend uh, is known for, and there's a variety of other ones, uh, Nexo and, and a number of others that do this. So what happens here? Uh, you have, uh, basically your crypto holdings, let's say it's Bitcoin, right? So let's say you're somebody and there's tremendous wealth in Bitcoin, right? The market cap of Bitcoin right now is about a hundred billion, right? So you've got basically people sitting there holding a hundred billion dollars, which is basically latent assets, right? You can't really do anything with it. So what they're allowing you to do is to put it up as, uh, so as a form of collateral and then they'll lend you real money against it, right? So now you can go and you can spend fiat or something else uh, based on this other asset. And if it turns out the value of the asset, if you think about this, this is like the ultimate collateral, right? Because if you were to compare to say real estate, first of all, the value of real estate is not uh, apparent all the time, okay? It's not really clear what real estate, it's within a margin of safety or margin of error rather. Uh, you kind of have an idea what it's worth but you're not tracking in real time. Okay, did the value of the property drop? Did it go up? Did it, et cetera, et cetera, right? You just say, okay, great. I've got this property, wonderful, <laughs> that's it. Well, here you're able to say, okay, I come in and I, uh, I take this, uh, uh, this uh, Bitcoin and I know I have a market value immediately, right? And if I secure it, I can liquidate it in real time if my loan to value ratio changes. So let's just use an example of how this might work. Let's say you have $100,000 in Bitcoin, you put it up there, let's say they lend you money at a rate of 70% loan to value. So they give you $70,000, okay? If the price of Bitcoin goes down and they wanna maintain that, they can just liquidate the Bitcoin and kind of make sure that you remain solvent. Like there's essentially zero credit risk in this situation, which is pretty amazing, right? Uh, and on the flip side, as it goes up, they can extend you a greater and greater volume of credit. So it's very cool in this sort of way, right? They could say, okay, great. You can have this expanding and contracting line of credit based on the value of your crypto holdings. Okay, so that's one thing that, uh, that happened. Uh, and what does that do? Well, it makes it more worthwhile to hold the crypto because you don't have to sell out of it in order to go and do something with it. Very cool, right? The next thing that happened was that you ended up with, when you have something like Uniswap, okay, which is a decentralized exchange, uh, how does this work? Let's say that I have two uh, Ethereum tokens that I want to trade. Let's just say, for instance, that we're talking about uh, USDT, Tether, and heck, Ethereum itself, right? And you want to trade between these. Well, in order for a trade to happen, when you're wanting to sell this one and buy this one, you need somebody who's selling this one at the same time in the same volume as you and buying this one in the same volume as you. And the chances that that's going to happen are close to zero, right? It's, it's not going to exactly match up. So in order to facilitate very rapid trading, what they did was they created liquidity pools. Okay, so a liquidity pool is basically where some other people will be willing to put up their uh, tokens and it will facilitate your buying and selling in more or less real time. Okay, very, very cool stuff. And uh, the flip side, why would people do that is because they get a little piece of the transaction fees that are going along there. Uh, a big portion of the transaction fees actually. And this has led to something called yield farming. Okay, so yield farming, people are making in some cases, you know, hundreds of percent a year. On a, you know, it's not necessarily a whole year period of that time that's been in there, but the annualized return in some cases is hundreds of percent. Uh, in some scam projects, you know, much, much higher. And, uh, and then you have kind of just crazy nuts things going on. So 
yield farming is a whole other conversation we can talk about in the future. But uh, there was recently a project they did over 2 million percent. <laughs> okay, uh, it didn't last for very long, right? It lasted a few days before it collapsed and people lost a bunch of money. So there's lots of scam projects out there. But it's really cool that, uh, that they're building A, this utility, so like there's an actual value to holding these tokens, and B, uh, this decentralized system. So why am I so bullish on DeFi and why do I think it's like a really good thing for the world? DeFi is filled with scams, okay? It's filled with all kinds of crap and this is kind of the norm among crypto. If you think even just back to the idea of Bitcoin, right? What was the early use cases of Bitcoin that really caught on was for the criminal world, right? You had the Silk Road, people could buy and sell, you know, drugs and all kinds of other stuff with Bitcoin. Okay, well that was you know, something that, that drove this. Now today, the majority of people holding Bitcoin are their criminals? No, absolutely not, right? So there's not like, it, it's kind of evolved beyond that. Then when we saw the ICOs, right? Again, of the, I don't know, thousand or a few thousand projects that launched 2017, 2018, a lot of those were scams or just complete sham products, projects, right? Hundreds of millions of dollars were raised and, you know, a lot of it was lost. But on the other hand, what happens over time is you filter out the ones that are sham projects and the real ones are surfacing as you know much more significant so that's super cool okay the same thing is true here with DeFi. like what you have to consider is that the world of finance has is very calcified there's virtually no innovation there right even with all the fintech stuff going on now where we're getting a little bit more and it's pretty cool because they're being able to digitize the the uh, regulatory stack and digitize the tech stack and provide it as a service in both cases and that accelerates the development and we've got a little bit better regulatory frameworks in Europe, especially places like Lithuania after setting up EMIs, things like this. Even though they've got all of that stuff and it's certainly a hot area, the ability to innovate extremely fast is quite limited because you have these constraints of centralized finance. Whereas when it comes to DeFi, it's an unregulated environment. So if you just look at the pace of innovation how much is happening. I was talking to uh, some people recently and they were talking about seeing a project launch, that project getting what they call forked, so copied and modified slightly within like a week and then within a few days three more variations of that one being copied and broken off. So you can just see like how quickly this iteration cycle is happening and how much advancement that brings to the space. So you know, when I look at the success of anything over a long period of time, I think ultimately what is the number one metric arguably is the pace of innovation, right? If you have an extremely high pace of innovation, it doesn't really matter how far behind you are behind the other people, because eventually you're gonna catch up and surpass them. And then at that point in time, you know, of course you have the marketing dynamics, you have network effects, you have, you know, all these different sorts of things, but that's a really, really big deal. So anyway, why, why do I explain all this for you, to you? Well, first of all, I think that it's very interesting to get to know uh, what's going on in this space and to be aware of, hey, how might this be useful to you in the future, as well as you know, what sort of investment opportunities are coming out of there. As I said, there's lots of scam projects, there's lots of nonsense, et cetera. And so I think you have to you know, do, diligence, uh, to do, uh, do due diligence carefully. But if you can dive into it, uh, there's all kinds of great things. And by the way, there's also great tax benefits if you're in some parts of the world. If you're in some parts of the world, crypto is taxed specially, so you can potentially pay no tax, which is also pretty, pretty crazy, uh, or pay diminished tax and things like this. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a little bit of like a summary of what's going on here. Oh, I'll end with one anecdote, which is, I remember I was telling a friend and client yesterday, I first heard about Bitcoin, I think it was in 2013, uh, around the time that the Silk Road went down. I remember I was sitting with a friend in, uh, in his car and we were talking one late, late one night and discussing you know, all kinds of things in the world and it was like, holy shit, like basically they did $2 billion of drug deals, et cetera, on the Silk Road and then it got taken down. And he said, God, this Bitcoin thing, you know, what's the deal here? And basically what had happened was all the demand from that activity had I think pushed the price of Bitcoin to like what $200 a Bitcoin. And then when the Silk Road went down, the demand collapsed and it dropped to like, I, I want to say $60 or something. And he was saying, hey, do you think we should buy some? And I was like, no, nah, I mean, I think like, you know, the demand is dead from this sort of thing, right? That was a big mistake. Um, and what I didn't realize was that the news cycle brought awareness to this technology that, you know, people didn't have before. And suddenly you saw it go from $60 to $1,200 before collapsing down to $400 and then kind of consolidating there and gradually uh, picking up 
hitting some point, and then in 2017, going from basically a thousand to twenty thousand uh, before going back and you know down to about three thousand. Now it's around a little over uh, around ten thousand. So uh, why why do I tell you this? I tell you this because I think about back then. I you know I didn't have that much money, but uh, but I certainly could have afforded to throw you know even a few hundred dollars into there not just as an investment, but to understand the future of technology, right? To like get a sense of like, hey, like how does this work? What's going on here? What are hardware wallets? How do you buy this stuff? What's the friction? What's the process? You know, oh, hey, there's this Bitcoin ATM things, et cetera. And you know, if I had thrown a couple hundred bucks in there, right? That would have turned into, you know, I mean, what is that? Uh, like 100, 200 times your money or something like that, that uh, could have come out of there, more than 200 times your money. So. That's pretty, pretty crazy, you know. Uh, where, where else would you have done that? I mean, it's, uh, it's nuts. And so I kind of look at it similar here, right? Where I say, okay, listen, I don't know how uh, DeFi is going to play out. I'm actively doing some research and you know working with some clients and things like this on evaluating things. Uh, but I'm kind of like, look, I would like to make some strategic investments uh, that help me to get to know and go through the process and understand what's happening in this evolving world of technology. And, uh, and maybe some of these things will pay off and maybe they won't, but you know, it's something that, it's an investment into the future. And I think that's really valuable. So anyway, hope that helps. If you guys want any assistance with anything to do with international structuring, with legally reducing your tax rates, with uh, asset protection, forming companies, uh, international banking, offshore banking, including banking for cryptocurrency stuff, uh, moving abroad, residencies, citizenships, payment processing, et cetera, please reach out to me. Uh, you can click the link below, clarity.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer to book a call, or you can check out our websites, offshorecitizen.net, offshorecapitalist.com. And I'm going to, oh, please click the subscribe and like button, share this video with your friends. I'm going to see you guys on the next video.